So I'd like to welcome our listeners today. I am being joined by Michael Green, who is a investigator of the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute and director of uh, the program for Gene Function and Expression at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you very much for giving us your time today. Well, thank you for the invitation. So we're going to be talking uh, with uh, Dr. Green today about a, a research ongoing in his lab that was just uh, published in uh, PNAS, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science um, Journal in July. And um, the work has uh, potential to, to be clinically relevant for Rett syndrome. So I think I'd like to start us off by having you explain in very simple language what are the highlights of the paper. Well, the, the main point of the paper uh, was to try to identify um, factors uh, and the basis by which X chromosome inactivation occurs. And X chromosome inactivation, as I think most of your listeners uh, in the audience knows, is the process by which one X chromosome in females is uh, shut off. Uh, and what we did uh, is a large-scale loss of function screen to identify um, genes that when when they lost their function would allow the silenced X chromosome to be uh, become activated. Uh, and we identified uh, a number of these factors uh, and which demonstrates that X chromosome inactivation uh, and silencing of the X is a reversible process. And I think then that was really reinforced by the fact that some of these factors, there are small molecule inhibitors uh, uh, that are available, and we showed that the small molecule inhibitors can reversibly inactivate uh, the X chromosome. Uh, uh, now, this has implications in particular for Rett syndrome, uh, in which, uh, in which it, the, a wild-type MECP2 gene in half the cells become silenced. So if we can turn on that, uh, that gene, uh, we, we're able to, we think we'll be able to have some potentially clinically beneficial effects. Right. Now, one of the... Uh, so, actually, let me ask you first. When you first started doing this, these experiments and you, and you realized that there were a number of factors that could reactivate the X, was that surprising to you? It, uh, I don't think it was surprising to me because we, we, we've had a long-standing long interest in uh, inactivation of genes in, and uh, in particular in tumor suppressor genes which get inactivated in cancer. Uh, and we've had a number of previous studies uh, in which we were able to show that we could reactivate these inactive genes uh, by identifying factors uh, that were involved in their silencing. And the, the, the hallmark of these inactivated tumor suppressor genes is really not that different than what the inactive X chromosome is like. The, the major difference being that in the in X chromosome inactivation, it's the entire chromosome that becomes inactivated, whereas in cancer, uh, it's specific genes at different chromosomes. But, but they're molecularly very, very similar. And so you know, we, we expected that when we went into the screen that we would um, be able to identify such factors. Uh, now, I know that there is this, there, it was very surprising to some people in the X chromosome inactivation field who think, that a, who, would, who think that the X chromosome is so tightly shut off that a single factor would not be able to inactivate it. There were multiple layers of control uh, that would all have to be inactivated, but that's not, our, our studies clearly show that that's not the case. Okay. So, um, you know, if we were, if, if the, the purpose here is to reactivate the entire X chromosome so that MECP2 would go along with that, of course, um, to, to, to potentially treat Rett syndrome. So then we have the issue of all these other genes coming back on. And that's always been a concern when we discuss this as a potential therapeutic approach. Someone, you know, when, when we have meetings, somebody will always say, well, wait a minute, what, it can't possibly be good to have all these other right. genes come on. 
So your paper right. suggested that may not be such a concern after all. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I still think it's a concern. It would be the ideal therapeutic would be something that would really selectively uh, reactivate the silent STEMI CP2 gene and nothing else. I'm not sure that's possible. I think there's a lot of efforts uh, to do that. And we have some other research. We have some other ideas how that might be done and certainly something we're pursuing. However, what we found uh, uh, is that uh, when you reactivate the entire uh, X chromosome, that, there, uh, that the total level of x linked gene expression in the long term is not increased, and that implies that there is another mechanism that regulates total x linked gene expression. And in our paper, and that we, 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 I think, demonstrated that pretty conclusively, but we also point out in the paper that there are a number of other studies uh, that are consistent with that finding. So I don't think it's an entirely new concept. Um, Okay, so even though you've got two copies of genes, there's something in the cell that keeps the levels of the proteins the, where they should be. The same. That's right. Right. Okay. And, and, and one of the, you know, prole uh, the, the uh, findings or theories that is kind of consistent with that view is something called Ono's hypothesis, which suggests that unlike all the other autosomal uh, all autosomal chromosomes, the autosomes, the, in the a female, there's only one, there's only one X being expressed, whereas all the other copies, there are two, uh, there are two chromosomes being expressed. And yet the level of total X-linked gene expression is similar to what occurs on the autosomes. So there's something called Ono's hypothesis, which suggests that there's a mechanism that can regulate uh, X-linked gene expression in addition to X chromosome inactivation. And, and we think that that may be related to the mechanism that our results show exist, although we don't know the detailed basis of, which suggests that when you turn on two X chromosomes, the total level of excellent gene expression becomes regulated. Okay, okay. So, um, in fact, in your paper, you described a mouse that has two X chromosomes on and that looks pretty healthy. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And that, and I think that's really uh, very persuasive. Um, the 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 other um, the other important feature I think of that finding is that the that mouse is really phenotypically very normal, and yet it has two X chromosomes on. So I think that the gene for that in, in that knockout mouse is called STC one. Uh, it's really a very poorly understood protein, might be a very good target uh, for um, uh, drug development to turn on the silent stacks because we know that the mouse can be perfectly normal when you knock that target out. Right, and that would apply for multiple X-linked diseases, not just Rett syndrome, but... but That's correct. Right. That's correct. Now, now that, that, that target, uh, there's not a, a drug for, there's not a small molecule drug for, but I think there are potential gene therapy approaches that we're pursuing, uh, in part thanks to the funding uh, from your organization, uh, that we could we, that could be used to try to uh, inactivate that target. Right. And we're doing that in mouse models. Right. So uh, that's a good segue to my next um, question. Could you tell us a little bit about your Rett syndrome project? So you're, you're testing some drugs and you're looking at some gene therapy approaches. Right. Can you just elaborate a little bit for us? Sure. So, uh, so in our paper, we described several druggable targets. Uh, we use very generic uh, drugs uh, to do those preliminary studies, but uh, these are major. These are major pathways in in the cell, regular cell signaling pathways, and there are many drugs that have been developed in the pharmaceutical industry that inactivate various parts of those regulatory pathways. So one of the things we'd like to do uh, is to test the collection of these drugs that inactivated various parts of the pathways and have very different properties uh, to see which ones might be the most beneficial and if any of those you know, might be potential therapies. Uh, uh, and one way we're trying to do that is uh, pharmaceutical companies have large collections of these drugs. They've studied them you know, for many years, and we're trying to get a hold of them so we can test them in our models. Uh, and then in a complementary approach, uh, as I said, we're working 
uh, here uh, using gene therapy approaches in collaboration with Guang Ping Gao, uh, who's at the University of Massachusetts, uh, uh, one of my colleagues. He's the director of gene therapy. He has, is an expert uh, in a gene delivery, uh, which has been shown to be potentially very uh, effective at delivering uh, genes to uh, to the brain, right. uh, and so we're working with him to enact, to to see what the effects are of inactivating several of the other genes that we found uh, in the study uh, would uh, whose inactivation leads to reactivation of the X chromosome. Uh, again, using mouse models, both um, for MECP2 expression uh, and then ultimately for Rett syndrome. Okay, it's been very interesting, and um, I wish you all the luck in the world as you move your experiments forward. And uh, is is um, is this one of the? Is it relatively uh, novel for your lab to be working on disease-specific uh, experiments, or did you focus more on kind of you know blue skies basic science before? Well, we we've had a mix. Uh, our labs, we we really have a. Um, We've had a long interest in basic gene expression mechanisms, but we've also had a long-standing interest in, in cancer. Yeah. Uh, so we've um, we, we, we've had a lot of sp disease-specific cancer focus. Uh, this is our first foray, you know, into in, into Rett syndrome. But I, I think it, I'm excited about it. I think it makes a lot of sense because it, it's a disease of, of gene expression, you yes. know. And I yes. think that's where we can maybe be able to leverage some of. Of, you know our expertise and working in that field for over thirty years. Well, we're you know I, I think I speak for all Rett parents when I say we're we're thrilled that you're working on Rett syndrome. I think from a, a funding agency's viewpoint, it's really important to work on lots of approaches in parallel. We may end up with kind of cocktail approaches. Uh, you don't know which one is going to work out. So I've always been excited about trying to reactivate MECP2 and also working on trying to reactivate the whole X. So congratulations on your paper. We wish you all the luck for your experiments, future experiments, and we hope to be able to check in with you soon and, and get an update. Thanks very much. I look forward to it. Thank you.